everybody, welcome to another Spectrum Economics video. Today I'm going to be touching on economic efficiency and the various types of efficiencies you get with um, economics. So there's several of them. Um, there's our productive efficiency, there's um, allocative efficiency, and there's Pareto efficiency. I'm also going to be looking at the end um, just a little bit on general equilibrium and how that also fits into efficiency as well. So that's basically four kind of four ways of looking at efficiency. Okay, let's start off with productive efficiency. So this is fairly first year economics kind of thing. And that's uh, what we've got, what we call, uh, uh, what's that, product uh, production possibility frontier or production possibility curve, depending on what textbooks you're reading. And that basically that's a curve or a frontier as they're calling it, that shows all the optimal combinations of of outputs, let's say. So in the simple diagram, you have two goods. It could be anything, you know, it could be bananas and pineapples. And basically you have, you know, your factors of production, you have your labor, you have your capital and all that. So, and it's assuming that, uh, take for example, labor is somewhat substitutional. So, for example, someone who can pick bananas can also pick pineapples and so on, you know. But it comes to a point where you have diminishing, diminishing returns. So that's why we generally have that curve shape. And as you can see here, so anything that falls on that production possibility frontier it is basically productive efficient because you're using your resources to the best that you can. And that line basically shows like the various combinations of good Y and good X in this case that you can get. And that is basically the best use of your resources. So that would be point B. So you've only got there that's on the line. You've also got point A. So that means there's a bit of inefficiency there. So, you know, someone... And it could be picking pineapples and stuff, you know, it might be daydreaming and stuff, you know, he's not making the most of his time to actually collect pineapples or bananas and stuff like that. Or, and so, you know, best uses, or it could be, you know, a technique that's not being done correctly, you could be using a better technique than he is, or, or something like that. So that, that would put you at A, so that's not the optimal point, so ideally you want to get on that curve. And there's also C as well, and that's actually beyond your possibility frontier, so in other words, it's unobtainable. So A and B, they're possible, you can obtain them. B being productive efficient, A not being productive efficient, but C is unattainable at this point in time, either because your labor doesn't have the, the skills necessary to, the, necessary to produce that amount of, of pineapples, bananas, whatever. But that, that's something that could become obtainable in the future. That is if your production possibility frontier can move out. And that, that could be because of improvements in technology or improvements in skill or all sorts of things. But anything that pushes that out eventually could mean that you could get to point C. So that could become your productive efficient anyway output. And then B, of course, would then would no longer be if you've actually pushed out that frontier further. So basically using this possibility uh, production possibility frontier describes what we mean by productive efficiency. So in a sense, it's the best use of your resources in order to, I guess, achieve as much output as you can. In this case, it's just within two goods. In, in an economy, it could be you know, millions of goods, so you can't quite graph that anyway. So this is just a very simple explanation. So how about allocative efficiency? So that is, it's a little bit different. And that comes to when you look at your marginal benefits and your marginal costs. So your marginal benefits tend to be decreasing over time. And as you, like for example, as you consume more and more of a particular item, where it could be food, for example, you have a burger, the first burger is great, you get a lot of benefit out of it. But the second one, the third one, the fourth one, you get very little benefit because you know, you've already satisfied your hunger. So you'd see falling marginal benefit. Whereas marginal costs can actually be falling and can actually be increasing. So, often it's stated that it generally starts to off decreasing as you get in certain benefits, I guess, or certain cost reductions, should I say, of being able to produce a larger number. But that is not sustainable. So eventually, you'll see your costs starting to climb. And whether your marginal cost and marginal benefit actually interact and whether it's declining, or it all depends really on the industry and the market. So for allocated efficiency to be achieved, you, you, you need to have your marginal cost equals to your marginal benefit. So in a sense that you know, as your marginal benefits are falling, or let's say, for example, your marginal costs are increasing, then once your marginal cost is greater than your marginal benefit, then it's not worth 
producing any more in the sense that the cost of that reduction is actually outweighing the benefit of that additional reduction. And also, marginal cost or marginal benefit would be where, ideally where your price would be. So your price would actually equal to marginal cost. And in terms of market structures, and I mentioned this I think in another video, you're basically looking at a perfectly competitive market structure. So that is where your price equals your marginal revenue, equals your demand, equals your average cost, equals your marginal cost and all of that. So that gives you a slightly different shaped um, curve. Whereas if you look at it in terms of a monopoly, you'd actually have your marginal cost equals your marginal benefit, but your price would be a lot higher than your marginal cost and you'd get profits out of that and you would not obtain allocative efficiency using uh, in a in a market structure which is a monopoly or even an oligopoly either you wouldn't get that because your price tends to be higher and your quantity is not sufficient so you have something called deadweight loss which I actually cover off in another video so that is um, your allocative efficiency how about Pareto efficiency that one is a little bit different but it's it's a little bit of similar lines to allocative efficiency it's about maximizing your utility so like take for example we got here which is the Edgeworth box so this in this scenario you're taking two people and we've got what we call indifference curves and indifference curve is a curve where you are indifferent between all the various options on there like for example you've got good X and good Y so if for example 10 of X and 1 of Y might give you the same level of satisfaction or utility as 10 of y and 1 of x. You know, 10 of y, 1 of x could give you the same as 1 of y and 10 of x. I get confused on what I'm saying. But anyway, if you know what I mean, different combinations along that curve give you the same level of satisfaction. So that is your indifference curve. And for this, we've got two people. So you get to the point where they actually interact or they're running tangent to each other. So that will be where you're maximizing your utility for each of these two people. So it gives you a situation, I think, as they define it in terms of Pareto efficiency. To be Pareto efficient, you can't make someone else better off without making someone else worse off. And that is what we got here, a contact curve. And that could mean basically person A getting almost everything, or it could mean person B getting almost everything. So it's not uh, in terms of equality, it doesn't take that into it. But in a sense that even if person A has to give up maybe only one of X in order for person B to get know, 500 of Y, then that potentially that could still be Pareto efficient because you are actually sacrificing in order for someone else to benefit. Even though you think, well, you know, they're only giving up one so someone else gets, would seem to be fair. But it's interesting because it doesn't really cover off on fairness. And in a sense that you can have redistribution, so you get so you can have a person A and B getting a good mixture of your different goods, but this doesn't necessarily have to follow the case. And there's another concept called Caldor Hicks, which actually involves the person that's got most of the utility from having a much higher consumption of your goods actually provide actually giving that to I call it whether that could be through some form of taxation or whatever actually providing it to the person who's actually getting less. So it's got a redistribution of your wealth to improve the quality. But Pareto efficiency is not really interested in that. The key behind that is basically you want a situation where it looks at a situation where you're not making someone worse off. Well, it's a situation where, yeah, you have to make someone worse off in order to make someone better off. So you, you're at that optimal point where, like, for example, you could have a situation where person A doesn't have to give up anything for person B to obtain something else, and that wouldn't be Pareto efficient, and that would force somewhere else on those curves. All right, so what am I going to look at now is a very basic general equilibrium model called the Robinson Crusoe model. Uh, and that is basically where you've, Robinson Crusoe, you know, if you heard the story, he lives on an island and you know, he's shipwrecked or something. And basically he has to do his own production and also he has his own consumption. So he has to allocate his time in terms of collecting, let's say, wood or collecting bananas or pineapples or coconuts or whatever. And then he has to collect, I guess, using the best of his skills and resources. And also he has to maximize his own satisfaction and utility from that. 
And what we got here is a little bit similar to the Edgeworth box, but this is what we got in terms of we got a production possibility frontier combined with an indifference curve. So the Robinson Crusoe model, he would be looking at a situation where he'd want to collect enough of X and Y, so X and Y could be, like I said, pineapples or it could be bananas, to actually satisfy his needs. And that's going to depend on the shape of those two curves. So for example, if he's really, really good at getting bananas, then he may actually collect more bananas because he's good at that. But if he really, really hated bananas, so if he's good at getting them, but actually hates them, he may dedicate more time to pineapples if that is going to give him more enjoyment and or satisfaction, shall I say, or utility. So you can, again, you can see that is where your indifference curve is actually tangent to your production possibility frontier. And that is where you get your optimal uh, level of, for Robinson Crusoe, I guess, optimal level of consumption or optimal level of work to obtain, uh, obtain those pineapples, bananas, whatever the case may be. All right, so that takes me to the end of this video. It's just a bit of, you know, a recap on some of the stuff I've covered in some of my other videos, but putting all the efficiency stuff in one place. So it's something for, um, I guess, for people to look at if you want to compare, you know, with productive efficiency, with allocated efficiency, with Pareto efficiency, or what you're getting with a very basic general equilibrium model. And I'll be talking about general equilibrium in another video later on in terms of what goes into that. And that's actually a very, very complex thing. And it's beyond a little bit more than the whole Robinson Crusoe stuff I mentioned just now. But that is... It's just on the basics that you're looking at, you know, several goods and you're looking at a broader picture rather than the one good market that we're looking at, what we call um, uh, partial equilibrium. So that's generally what we looked at in the other videos compared to general equilibrium that factors in a lot more things, a lot more different goods and stuff like that. But anyway, if you like this video, remember to uh, click the like button. And if you want to see more videos along these lines, basic economic concepts or key economic concepts, remember to hit the subscribe button. I've got a number of other videos as well relating to cost-benefit analysis and game theory. And I'm also working on my book, which is uh, Vegan Economics. I'm going to be putting up videos relating to some of the chapters that I'm going to be coming up with in the coming months and all that. So, you know, stay tuned for that. And yeah, if you're interested, like I said, remember to hit subscribe. And also, I think you hit the bell so you'll be alerted um, to when the new videos come up. But anyway, thank you for watching and uh, hopefully I'll see more of you.